so what, what I want to talk about um, what I want to talk about here is is um, I want to talk about where Bitcoin is now and also where the world is heading and the role that Bitcoin and these other technologies can play in this evolving or changing world. And in particular also, uh, what are the targets or focuses that we should be looking ahead to. Uh, so the, the potential of power promise is inside cryptocurrency can be realized. And um, also, uh, thank you for having me here as well. Uh, I'm somebody also that uh, believe that ideas play a really important role in shaping uh, the world around us and human society. And uh, I also want to talk about how uh, certain uh, ideas about the human being, uh, that saw the human being as a mechanical object, got mixed up with uh, politics and technology, and how, uh, and how, when, how, uh, we use this idea of the human being as a way of uh, retreating from the world around us. And the reason we did that is because it gave us a kind of reassurance. The reassurance it gave us was uh, immensely comforting. And the thing is, is that Um, it's, we know it's fake. It's a it's a dream world, that uh, but uh, where like nothing makes sense. But it's something that we've uh, created, and uh, I also want to talk about how these ideas, the effect they had on technology. Uh, so, in particular, there was uh, a BBC documentary in the '60s called uh, "Towards Tomorrow." in which it presented uh, different possible visions of, uh, uh, of the future human society. And, uh, and this actual conflict actually begins uh, in the 60s between two men called B.F. Skinner and Lewis Mumford. Uh, between uh, the, uh, the, uh, between the, people who, the people who were like the technology utopians and uh, the people who uh, were looking to see how they could use technology to empower human beings and B.F. Skinner he was a, a cognitive uh, psychologist and what he he asked the question in this age of uh, individualism and uh, mass democracy where uh, we could no longer where uh, punishment was no longer an effective way of uh, managing the society. How could we continue to be able to manage the society? And he, he created an experiment where they put a pigeon in a box and every time the pigeon did a correct behavior, they would reward it with a pellet of food. So in this way, they were able to train the pigeon through a system of reward to, do, to perform the correct behavior. And B.F. Skinner, he actually took this experiment one step further. So in a mental hospital in San Bernardino, California, uh, what they did is uh, when the mental patients did a good behavior, they gave them uh, a piece of paper money. And with this paper money, they could sit at a nice table with a nice dinner cloth and uh, uh, with like nice cutlery. So in the mental hospital, what BF created was a system of management based off of reward and what's really interesting about this experiment is it's something very eerily similar to what we live in today where uh, where we have a society which is managed by a small elite group of people simply to keep the capital flowing to keep the society stable while uh, making themselves uh, enormously powerful and enormously rich in the same documentary uh lewis mumford he uh he, so there's actually a video on YouTube. Maybe I can, I can show it actually. Uh, he, 
do I do this? No. Does anybody know how to get out of this? You're trapped. Yeah, it doesn't want me to leave. I think the button, big button on the bottom right. Okay. No. Bottom right. Wait, when you move the mouse, you move the mouse. Do you see right there. Oh, there. this one? Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay. So in this uh, video, uh, Lewis Mumford, he first uh, criticizes uh, B.F. Skinner, and then he proposes a new way of using the technology to uh, empower human beings. So, sorry. It's very, it's very difficult for me to do two things at once. My, my mind is like... Okay, so this one. Oh, there's no sound. Is there any sound here? Okay. Is it possible to have sound? You're playing it on the computer? Yeah. No, I'm playing it off my head. No, but <laughs> I mean from your computer, no. From the, the, where the music. Maybe yeah. this thing. Anyway, um, yeah, I can try and do that. I don't know if it will. Let me see if it's okay. Ah, perfect. Now turn it up. Okay. Skinner has a, <laughs> a very ingenious way of making a system of highly compulsive organization <laughs> seem as all a very humane one. This is a great and original contribution. The old fashioned uh, mechanical collectors of the mega machine. They use punishment as a way of enforcing conformity. Skinner and the psychological school that he represents have found a much better system than punishment. They first tried it out on animals, and now they're applying it to human beings. Reward them. Make them do exactly what you want uh, them to do without the whip. But with some form, some form of sort of drug or candy, which will make them think that they're actually enjoying every moment. This is the most dangerous of all systems of compulsion. That's why I regard uh, Skinner's War of the Tomb as another name for hell. And it would be a worse hell because we wouldn't realize we were there. We would imagine we were still in heaven. Uh, most of the reactions that have taken place in our life, including those that uh, come under the head of the, the beatniks and the hippies, have uh, had some underlying sense uh, in the reaction itself. But the remedy is part of the disease. Uh, the remedy, in fact, makes it easier for, for the institutions that now have that hold upon us to uh, be even more compulsive and even more effective than ever before. If we don't care, if we drop out, if we lose ourselves in insane fantasy of some kind, whether a natural fantasy of the neurotic or the chemically induced fantasy of someone who takes uh, drugs, we lose our possibility restoring our own economy, of taking charge of our life, because this requires greater energy, greater effort than that which uh, is required to live through the daily life of a machine worker. We have to become fully, fully uh, activated human beings, every part of us, tremendously alive and uh, ready to take charge. And this can't be done by people who are in escape, people who are in that form the habit of total rejection. We must know what we want, not just what we don't want. Um, so at the same time in the 60s, 
um, people really started to become uh, fascinated with computers. And at that time, computers were gigantic machines occupied entire rooms and they had been born out of uh, industry, out of the military, and they reflected that in their design. And one guy called John McCarthy, uh, he, saw, he, he saw how uh, programmers, they would write a computer program and maybe they had a small mistake, like a comma missing, and then they'd have to wait two or three days to be able to get another appointment to be able to use the computer to correct it. And this really slowed down uh, people's ability to really uh, use the computer effectively. And John McCarthy, he was, his uh, parents, his uh, father was a labor organizer, his mother was active in the suffragette movement, uh, they were both uh, communists and he was also a member of the Communist Party and he was uh, working at the time in MIT and he had the idea that uh, if that instead of one person using a computer at the same time what if there was a way of sharing this computer between a group of people and he first proposed the idea of uh, time sharing systems uh, what happened then uh, in after the Cuban Missile Crisis was America had seen how their computer systems were in complete disarray and uh, they were looking for a solution and they went to MIT where John McCarthy and the colleagues of his who he had inspired uh, told the American government that they had the solution to the information problem that they were having and the solution lied in the time sharing systems that they were creating. Uh, so one of the guys, uh, one of the uh, project leads of Project Mac, which was the project that DARPA invested in, was jo uh, John uh, Licklider. And he actually, uh, he, so John McCarthy proposed the idea of a computer as an electric utility, and Licklider took it one step further. He, thought of the concept of a kind of computing space like that everybody could access to an intergalactic computer network. Uh, one of the things, one of the great anticipated discoveries of Project Mac was that when more than one person can use a computer at the same time, those, com those people will use the computer to communicate with each other. Project Mac led to development of Multics, which led to development of Unix, and it also led to the development of ARPANET, which led to the development of uh, the internet. Uh, John McCarthy, he later left from uh, MIT and founded the Artificial Intelligence Lab at Stanford. He was also the guy that invented the term artificial intelligence and developed the programming language called LISP. Uh, so the 80s were a very interesting time. It was the beginnings of the birth of the first personal computer. And this was out of a community of hackers who really believed in the transformative power of technology to shape the world around them. It had been the, the drive or main motivation uh, for the development of these new uh, technology systems that were not just in the hands of centralized military and uh, industry. Uh, but with the development of the first personal computers, a lot of uh, private companies from industry now saw a new business opportunity. And whereas before this community had been very marginalized, a lot of capital now started to flow into this community. Uh, that was something that was very important because it led to development of uh, mobile phones and laptops, technologies that we can now use today, as opposed to just being in the hands of a uh, few marginalized hackers. But, in the process of that happening, something in very, very important that was the essence or the heart of this movement was being lost. Uh, before, hackers used to uh, share uh, code between each other. They really developed uh, the product with a sense of intent of having a, a socio-political impact on the world around them. They were driven by ideas of freedom, of humanity. But what began to increasingly happen was uh, companies would come in 
that buy up products that uh, make them proprietary, that uh, shut, shut themselves off from other companies, and the culture began to change. A lot of the hackers just went along with it. But uh, there were uh, some people who uh, rejected this change. And one of them was Richard Stallman. Richard Stallman uh, stood up in front of the hacker community and he basically said that, uh, that this is wrong. It doesn't have to be like this. Technology is a very powerful uh, force or tool that we could use to shape the world around us and that we need to build our own free technology. And he proposed to the hacker community to build their own free operating system. Uh, and he, in 1985, published the GNU Manifesto. Uh, a lot of people thought that Stallman was uh, crazy, that his plans were uh, uh, unfeasible, that how could a few people uh, without any funding or any resources build their own computer operating system. But he was a guy that was very determined. And he went off and he started to build his own operating system. That, so, uh, by the early 90s, uh, Linux first started to come together. And what also happened at that time was that cryptography was uh, classified as a government munitions uh, in, in America. And you couldn't export a cryptographic tool uh, out of America. Uh, it was the same as like exporting a, a, a gun or a bomb or, or a jet. And uh, there was an anti-nuclear activist who he up the world's first uh, free and uh, encryption software for the masses, which anybody could download off of the internet and use. And that, that guy was uh, Philip Zimmerman. And he uploaded this software to the internet. And what happened was the American government arrested him and he was facing a court case where uh, he was, uh, where they were threatening him with 10 years in jail. Uh, so what Philip Zimmerman did to get around that was he, he published the source code of PGP in a book and you could buy this book internationally and you could separate the pages and you could scan it into your computer and then you could convert that scanned images into text and convert it into source code. So what Philip Zimmerman did is he used the First Amendment rights to publication and free speech as a way to get around the government uh, uh, censoring the distribution of PGP. Philip Zimmerman ended up to win that case. The US government, after he published his book, just dropped the case. They realized it's not feasible. And two things emerged from that. First is that code became a form of speech, that we can write code and, we can, and it doesn't matter how the people use the code, that we are protected as programmers uh, from the law and the state. The second thing is that in, uh, cryptography uh, now became a tool that anybody could have access to. In 1992, we saw the publication of the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. In this manifesto, it called for using this new tool, power of cryptography, as a way to challenge the established power of the central banks and the state. That we could use this technology to construct a new free world. In 1993, we saw the publication of the Cypherpunks Manifesto. It, it basically said with the, these new privacy technologies that we can protect ourselves from the power of state, of police and the law. At the same time in the early 90s, Linux was now uh, a movement that had a lot of momentum behind it. Uh, people now were starting to imagine uh, not just building an operating system, but building all sorts of uh, different technologies, new forms of human social organizations to liberate humanity. Uh, and uh, and and um, and then uh, in the mid nineties, uh, so then something very uh, so then there was something strange happened, which was uh, uh, if you actually read the GNU manifesto, in the manifesto it 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 says here is the software that we made, here is the software that we're going to make. These are, this is how we're going to do it. And these are the tools that we need to, uh, this is what we need to be able to do this work. So Stallman, he didn't just go and write lists and people joined with him on that endeavor. He also laid out a vision for how this technology is, is going to look like, how we're going to reach that objective. 
But then uh, once Linux started to emerge, uh, that vision, uh, it no longer, it, it, it no longer, it went beyond just being a Unix operating system. Now people started to build desktops, user applications, even the whole technology world changed completely. And instead of updating his vision or stepping up to that uh, responsibility to give some sense of direction to the free software movement, Richard Stallman took a hands-off approach. And what happened was a new group of guys stepped into that. There was, it was part of an overall transformation inside of the technology world. So in, um, in 1997, in 1996, that was when John Perry Barlow published the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace. So in 1991, the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto called for using this tool of cryptography to change the world around us, to challenge the established powers. The Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace called instead for a withdrawal from the world into this new world of cyberspace. Now, when cyberspace was originally termed by William Gibson in his novel Neuromancer, it was originally a very dystopian uh, term. In his novels, people can literally reach over the internet and crush people's minds, killing them. It was a world of unadulterated power where, uh, where large multinational corporations and states operate outside of the law. Uh, but the, these new uh, Silicon Valley uh, uh, Californian uh, ideologists took that idea and they turned it into, some, into, into something positive. And, and in uh, uh, the Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace, it talks about cy cyberspace as being a world outside of the established old institutions of power and the old world, a world where everybody was equal nodes in a network, where the old powers and institutions no longer had any relevance in cyberspace, which as we know today is something that is, is, is not true at all. We're, fa we're facing a very big problem today with the role of, of power and surveillance and multinationals and finance. Uh, powers that we have to recognize and understand if we want to be able to effectively use our skill as technologists to challenge these established groups. In 1997, uh, there was also another pub very important publication, which was the Cathedral on the Bazaar. So whereas Richard Stallman and the Free Software Movement had said, the reason we built this technology is because we believe in human freedom. And we think technology is something that is fundamental to uh, human civilization and that everybody should have access to these tools of power. The new open source movement said that freedom is not an important question, but the reason why we're interested in this software is because it's cheaper, it's more convenient, it's lower cost. And in this book, The Cathedral and the Bazaar, it said that the way open source uh, was developed is as, a, as an open marketplace, spontaneous, without, le without any form of leadership or vision. The programmers simply, they had like a personal itch that they wanted to scratch and they would uh, develop a solution. Somehow through that, uh, software would be developed. Uh, so, then, uh, so then in the early 2000s, uh, we saw like another explosion or wave of development of new software, which was inspired by Napster in 1999, which after the music industry attacked it, saw the birth of BitTorrent, when a guy called Bram Cohen, he, wanted, he had the idea, how could we decentralize every aspect of this software so that the music industry could not attack it? And BitTorrent led to development of a whole multitude. It inspired many different areas of not just technology, but also of politics, uh, uh, Wikipedia, uh, uh, yeah, Wikipedia and uh, all the social networks, they were also products of BitTorrent. BitTorrent led to the development of Friendster, Friendster to MySpace and to Facebook. Uh, Wikipedia was born as a project as well. With Wikipedia uh, was birthed the idea that we could build a global encyclopedia where everybody could contribute uh, a small piece of knowledge and through that we could assemble all of the human knowledge into a global repository. Uh, uh, 
And uh, also, but then also uh, because of how the failing music industry used the power of politics to attack uh, BitTorrent, and in particular the Pirate Bay, saw the birth of the, of the Pirate Party. Uh, the Pirate Party ha initially had like a huge amount of momentum and a huge amount of will behind it. It even got into the uh, German Bundestag. At one point it was pulling in the double digits. But then uh, something strange began to happen. And to understand this transformation, we, we can, for example, look at the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring was uh, a whole bunch of revolutions where uh, a lot of people using these new net networked technologies were able to spontaneously mobilize onto the streets and for our established powers. But then very quickly, when all these people began to come together, just like in Occupy, uh, they, they realized they didn't really have a, a vision to take them forwards on the next step. So for example, what happened in Egypt was a lot of liberal youngsters mobilized through Facebook and uh, and uh, they went to Tahrir Square, and a lot of people were killed, and there was a lot of sacrifice made for that, uh, for that uh, uh, mobilization of people. And they ended up throwing out the military, and once they threw out the military, they said, okay, now what do we do? What next? And into that chaos, into that disarray, swept, came a group of, of well-organized uh, Muslim uh, reactionary fundamentalists with a compelling vision of the society that was able to organize effectively and seize power. And then these same liberal youngsters, they went back to Tahrir Square and they asked the military to come back and to rescue them. In the technology world, so with, this, is, this also happened to the Pirate Party. The Pirate Party, they never, they never specified what is our policy, what is our vision of society. And very quickly, in many national countries, it actually became a joke. Uh, they, they had this idea of using technology to establish a direct democracy. And, they even, and despite not having, they took pride in the fact that they had no compelling vision that, would, uh, that was driving them forward. They said, okay, we are the operating system, we are the mechanism, but you, the people, are the decision makers. In many instances, they would set up these platforms for people to be able to vote democratically, but very few people would participate. They weren't able to electrify people into these, uh, into these systems for uh, people to get engaged in politics to decide their own fate. Uh, then something interesting happened. People started to, uh, uh, statistics started to be released about Wikipedia. And when we start to look at, uh, when we start to look at these uh, statistics, the actual reality that they were telling was very different from, uh, from the one that we, uh, from the reality that we were telling, or the one that we believed in. Uh, what they showed was that Wikipedia was not written by a huge mass of people, all contributing a small sentence here and there. That the vast majority of this online encyclopedia was written by a very small group of people who really believed in uh, the, the mission or the value proposition that Wikipedia was proposing. And these were people that, to the detriment of their own lives, uh, spent huge amounts of hours every day editing an online encyclopedia, trying to build up this repository of human knowledge. When we began to look at open source software, we began to see that actually it wasn't that there were hundreds of programmers all contributing a small a patch or line of or bug fix of code here and there. Actually, even in large communities or large projects, there was always a very small, dedicated group of programmers who really believed in, in open source or the ideals of the project. And that was what inspired them to develop that project. So the reason why this is... Uh, so actually, I forgot to scroll for a lot of things. So... Um, so into that, um, when that free software movement was, or open source movement was experiencing a decline, that was when Bitcoins uh, came along. And Bitcoin had a really important role in reinvigorating this 
uh, technology movement. It suddenly brought back this sense of being able to use technology to uh, shape something. It suddenly gave us a new sense of direction. And this is really evident from Satoshi putting into the, uh, into the first transaction into Bitcoin the message of the central banks. A very powerful message about the bailing out of the central banks. The, um, the Bitcoin was uh, really influenced by libertarian and, and uh, cypher cypherpunk uh, uh, ideology, which in the early history of Bitcoin, when the Bitcoin Foundation and when a certain group of business people started to try and establish themselves over Bitcoin to try and uh, take charge of this project, the, it was indisputable that the origins of Bitcoin were political. They tried many times to paper over the fact that Satoshi was a libertarian. They tried to hide that to say, you know, uh, Bitcoin is politically neutral. There's no proof that it has political origins. But the fact is, is that in the very first transaction of Bitcoin was written a mutable proof of Bitcoin's destiny or purpose. On the very first uh, website for Bitcoin, it said Bitcoin is a form of peer-to-peer -peer money that cannot be controlled by governments and central banks. So then this group of people tried to take over Bitcoin and there was a really important process of struggle for the uh, soul or, uh, or in the essence of what Bitcoin is really about. And that was a struggle that was uh, that was actually won by uh, our side. The values of Bitcoin as a piece of technology for uh, human freedom and with the idea of privacy and the role of central banks got put back into the heart of Bitcoin. However, uh, in terms of the technology world now, where do we find ourselves? And in terms of cryptocurrency, uh, it's first of all very important to analyze uh, what has happened, in particular, uh, why, uh, so for example, where Bitcoin finds itself now is as a technology project, in the beginning, there was a sense of destiny, a sense of uh, direction, that people were really talking about uh, going to Africa, about uh, South America, about the role of central banks, and really trying to conceptualize what is it that we can do to spread Bitcoin to these markets as an organized, effective community. What's happened to Bitcoin now is Bitcoin has transformed in the same way a lot of earlier technology movements have transformed into a kind of static world where now we've withdrawn away from the world into the technology. And now we just kind of want to keep the system stable. We want to do a few bug fixes here and there. Programmers want to work on, a f on some new technologies. For example, Lightning is a very interesting technology, but there is no sense of how these technologies fit together. And in particular, there is a very narrow focus, like an almost technocratic focus on Bitcoin as just uh, a, a, a form of money or currency and no kind of experimentation or wider perspective about what is the potential latent in this technology to transform government, politics, economy, all areas of society. It's because of that very restricted technocratic view that a very large group of developers split off from Bitcoin and started Ethereum project. Ethereum project has its own set of problems, but in terms of the entire cryptocurrency space now, the market is becoming extremely fragmented into a huge array of different products with no sense of coherency between about how all these different parts move together. There's no sense of, um, of destination about what is the discourse or, or destiny of this technology so that it can inform technological development. It's very important in always in a company or an organization of human beings that there is a, a vision that drive that body of, or culture of human beings because every person is different, everybody fulfill a role within the wider organization 
And just like the free software movement, what happened to Linux was Linux was a project, it was a decentralized community of people that really thought that we're going to build the new operating system for the world. We're going to spread this free technology to everybody. And what happened was that there was no, uh, there was no sense of coordination or, or vision behind that. And the project became hopelessly fragmented. We ended up with multiple different uh, desktop environments, dozens of different text editors, uh, calculator applications, and we did not have one decent video editor. To build a video editor is a very complex thing. It required many different people to work together. Whereas to build a calculator application, anybody can do that. A lot of new people entered into this uh, community and there was, no, there was no advice about, okay, what projects can you join to? What are the main objectives that we as a free software community are trying to head towards? Uh, so now I see this happening in particular in uh, cryptocurrency in Bitcoin. For example, if you go on the Blockstream website, uh, and don't get me wrong, they're a very skilled technical group of people, but if you go on the website, there's a page and it's called Elements. And when you look at that page, there is a random list of technologies, but there is no description about how these technologies fit together, what, how these technologies are going to work to deliver a product. And it was actually Steve Jobs, and don't get me wrong, I have a lot of distaste for the guy, but Steve Jobs actually said that, that, he, that it's incorrect to start with the technology and work back to the customer. Always we should start with the customer, the customer's experience, and work back to the technology. This is something that's extremely lacking in Bitcoin now because, uh, because, um, because the entire project has become dominated by engineers and purely technical people that that maybe there are other areas of um, other areas of uh, human knowledge that if we put a tiny as opposed to putting a huge amount of energy into engineering and software development we put like just a tiny amount of that into other areas that we can uh, vastly boost the spread of this technology and I, I went to uh, Berlin just like a couple of weeks ago well, actually, just a week ago, or was it that long? Well, a few days ago. Um, and it's, it's incredible to see that one of the main Bitcoin wallets, which is Electrum, this project has been around for years. You guys are doing a really uh, great work developing a very usable piece of Bitcoin software that gives people access to all of the major Bitcoin features. It's the Bitcoin wallet that's in tails linux and yet it's just one guy with two software engineers and yet i see a lot of uh, big companies working with exchanges and so on and they have hundreds of employees it's not really clear to me what all of these hundreds of employees are doing so if as a community we came together and we said okay maybe this areas they're not, they don't make so much profit but they are areas of importance and we need to support those areas because they bring value to the rest of the project. And not just about development, but for example, uh, there is also a tendency now that everybody want to discover the new next big thing. And that means that there is a, a huge amount of focus into theory and into new papers for new techniques. But very little of that new technology being developed is being put into the hands of users. And a lot of the wallets we're using are lacking in, in user experience, UI development. So it's like when you talk to uh, young people studying physics and they all say, I want to discover the grand theory of everything. And that is like a huge problem. There are so many people uh, devoted to that. And yet there are all of these basic low hanging fruit that need to be taken. But that is not a question of, of technology. That is a question of human organization. Uh, we don't have our own telephony, uh, telecommunications infrastructure to make, big, to, to make Bitcoin payments over in a secure way. Uh, we, don't, we haven't developed uh, radio infrastructure or hardware to be able to use Bitcoin on a wide scale for millions of people. Uh, the knowledge to be able to scale Bitcoin to a national level has, it doesn't exist. Uh, there's a, a severe lack in anonymity wallets. Samurai, Samurai Wallet is doing a very good job, but there are a lot of new techniques being developed. So there's a lot of, uh, there's, a, there's many areas 
in cryptocurrency that need to be developed and a lot of cryptographic primitives which implementations don't exist in user side so as an organization uh, we are organizing to train hackers in Barcelona uh, to be able to so to be able to uh, manage different projects uh, in an organized way uh, to develop uh, all of these uh, projects to do with uh, wallets, exchanges, infrastructure, hardware and so on. Uh, not just to do with cryptocurrency, not just to do with Bitcoin, but to do with uh, wider technology to take some of these uh, resources and invest them into development of, of electronics, hardware, free software, free technology and telecommunications. Uh, we basically have like a four point program, which is uh, uh, we, that there need to be like a vision. That vision is informed by uh, uh, geopolitical analysis, sociology and so on. Uh, the, the techno that we apply the technology for socio-political change. We don't construct technological systems that will enable people to be more comfortable, to have like a more easier life. We actually look where is there an opportunity in the market for us to go to be able to shape that situation through the power or tool of technology. Uh, also, uh, all of these technologies, they need to form an ecology, an integrated fabric or a sense of uh, coherency working together. A large portion of that is, uh, is also putting that to paper, describing the technologies that we're developing, not just as our organization, but as a movement, as like a wider assembly of people, what are all the projects people are working on? How can all these projects fit together to, to give a coherent vision? And that all of these technologies need to, uh, need to be adaptable on a human scale. Everybody now is trying to develop like a, a single global product. They say, when they think about uh, Bitcoin, they say, okay, how can I, how can I spread Bitcoin? Uh, and they think about an individual. It's like, I need to make it easier for individuals to be able to use this technology. And the type of individual that they develop the product for is an individual like themselves. We take the opposite approach, which is we're saying that people around the world are different. There are different regions, different cultures. We can analyze those different regions. We can see where is there an opportunity in those markets. And the, there is no universal piece of technology that can fit all this wide array of human society. But what we can do is we can give toolkits, we can give uh, tools, to empower people to solve problems on a local scale, on a human scale. And what is in interesting about Lewis Mumford is that Lewis Mumford actually talked about uh, two modes of technology. He talked about mega techniques. So uh, for example, you've seen a lot of uh, um, technology projects today. Uh, every, there's a lot of projects that are trying to develop these huge monolithic uh, pieces of technology that have so many working parts uh, fitting together. They require like a huge number of skilled people and they're, they're kind of like big make it or break it projects. We actually subscribe to the Unix philosophy, which is what Lewis Mumford called uh, ecotechnics, which is build a brick and each brick has a very simple implementation Every uh, human being can easily understand what that brick can do. People can put those, pe those Lego bricks together to build products to suit their individual needs. Um, and lastly, the, uh, the, there needs to be a wide diffusion of these ideas and concepts through, uh, and also technologies through a network of academies and an organization of hackers to coordinate these projects. So for example, we want to spread, if we want to spread Bitcoin in Africa, uh, maybe it's as simple as making a leaflet or developing a very simple piece of software that, uh, that, and, and training people there to be able to use it, that they won't necessarily just randomly discover it over the internet and adopt it. And uh, what is the driving philosophy of our organization is uh, polytechnics, which was proposed by Lewis Mumford as well. He described two modes of technological development, which is uh, monotechnics, which is technology that which develops for its own sake. When we develop technology and we forget about ethics, we forget about what is the purpose or reason behind why we're developing this technology, when we simply uh, develop a piece of technology to, sh to uh, sell more products, to shift more units. 
It could be, a, it could be a something as sinister as developing a piece of surveillance technology for banks or, I don't know, KYC technology, or it could be something more benign as developing a useless uh, 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 gaming application on, on an iPhone for people to distract themselves with. The, that technology uh, has, every piece of technology has, uh, has different effects on the world around it. Uh, we have to kind of comprehend, uh, not just blindly spread and develop technology, because, uh, for example, this mobile phone, it was made in a factory. A factory worker is doing the mechanical work. That factory worker is a component in a larger me mechanized apparatus. He has lost a piece of hu his humanity. So uh, technology does more technology doesn't necessarily always lead to a better, stronger, more uplifted, freer humanity. However, uh, we believe that technology can be used to improve the world around it. And that come through an analysis of the social effects of the technology we developed, which is informed by our vision. And that is what Lewis Mumford called polytechnics. So the, po the, the technologists can't just develop technology blindly while ignoring the rest of the world. We have to be deeply connected with society, politics, understand uh, established uh, powers of finance and politics exist now, and think about how we can use the technology to uh, help humanity progress through the powers of mechanisms towards uh, a society where, uh, every, where every person is able to become empowered and, uh, and decide their uh, destiny. All right, thank you. You have a question? Yeah, Amir, um, I want to talk about some trends in the mining. So you've got two of the very large mining pools in China right now controlling, I guess it's uh, maybe 42% of the hash rate and they're approaching the 51% level, which would of course uh, constitute a 51% potential for a 51% attack. And, um, you know, there's been a couple of times in the past where this has, uh, we've floated with this. Uh, this looks like a pretty serious um, hash power uh, source. Uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, so uh, he was asking about uh, the threat now of uh, mining cartels, which in China are becoming very established, very well organized, and controlling more than 50% of the hash rate. So, uh, first of all, it's something interesting there, which is that these are uh, mining companies. They're, they're, they're very well organized, they're very coherent, and yeah, they're forming a cartel together. And as a community, to be able to, uh, as we saw with the soft fork, to be, able to, ch to be able to not allow their power to totally take over cryptocurrency requires some level of coordination or organization between all the elements of this crypto community. About the threat of uh, miners over cryptocurrency, uh, I would actually say that Bitcoin is the most promising cryptocurrency we have now. Uh, it has a lot of potential, uh, but I don't think it's uh, necessarily destined that Bitcoin is gonna succeed. It could be some other project, uh, Ethereum, Despite, despite all their rhetoric, uh, they might actually manage to overcome their technical problems and they might actually succeed. Uh, I think 10 years from now, 20 years from now, if we're still talking about Bitcoin, then uh, probably we've failed as a project. Uh, but why I'm interested in going forwards is uh, always something that I've noticed in technology development is there is a small group of idealists who develop some new radical proposition uh, for society and that proposition never ever really managed to sustain itself long term and what happened is another established group of guys uh, managed to make a business model off of it driven by profit 
and take those ideas and bring it to society. They actually become the technologies that reach society. And the danger is with Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is it lose its radical value proposition. Uh, right now, I saw just a new project was announced. Maybe I can show it here. Uh, which was, uh, which is a blockchain for um, uh, credit rating scores and microcredit. So these ideas of smart contracts, of blockchain, of decentralized law could become a new mechanism for, for example, the Chinese government to better manage their population through gamification, through credit scores, through uh, credit, uh, decentralized crypto credits. So that is the danger that we're facing. Um, and it could be that a bank or a big corporation come along, develop a new uh, cryptocurrency and that become the cryptocurrency that's adopted. It's exactly what happened to Napster. Napster, uh, as a project was shut down by the RIAA. It was, a people, it was a project for people to freely share music. Steve Jobs came, he hired most of the people from Napster. He took most of the ideas from Napster and he developed iTunes. Except in this case, we're not just talking about something simple as people sharing music. We're talking about an opportunity for us to liberate people from a system where central banks literally print money which is people sometimes work jobs that they know has no purpose whatsoever, jobs that they completely hate for a piece of money, a piece of paper that is printed by a central bank. Bitcoin is, our, is one of our greatest opportunities to liberate ourselves from that system of mass conscription of labor or mass enslavement, which is really what it is. And what that means is that we, as a community, we can't, then we have to step up to the plate. We can't, and in, the, in the same way that the free software movement got taken over by open source, and open source threw out the political core of it, and then the project ended up to result in nothing. Uh, for example, a lot of people will tell me Linux was a success because Linux is now powering Android phones. How is that a success? We developed a free, free software and a proprietary company, Google, a very sinister proprietary company, took our software and used it to make a product. So we're basically developing software for Google to use in their products. The same thing with Unix. Unix was taken and used to build Mac operating system. So we're basically doing the free work for large corporations and governments. We're basically doing the work for them. So if we want to, uh, if we, want, if we want to be able to actually realize the actual potential of these technologies, we're going to have to step away from this uh, silly, almost childish-like uh, childish uh, desire for people to just kind of split themselves off or fragment themselves and pretend they're making a revolution, going to conferences and events, partying, and celebrating that they've made the revolution, we, haven't, we still haven't changed anything. We thought that if everybody would use Bitcoin, then it would just spontaneously manifest in society. Everybody know about Bitcoin now. I sit on the plane, I, I talk with people next to me, and they tell me they, years ago, they bought a tiny amount of Bitcoin. It's something deeper than that about why Bitcoin still hasn't managed to persevere or succeed. And that means that as a community, we're going to have to become organized and we're going to have to, we're going to, have to develop like a plan and we're going to have to work to that plan. It can't just be a few uh, tech bros or, or hackers in their bedrooms playing around with code, developing products. Right now, uh, a, lot of very, a lot of big companies are getting very well financed, getting huge amounts of capital and they're actually uh, gaining, uh, the, they're, they're taking a lot of the interest and talent into their organization.
not organizations that are concerned with changing the world or enhancing human freedom. They're concerned with making profit. They're perfectly willing to work with regulators and banks and governments. They have no uh, moral ethical issues with that. Yeah, sorry, I didn't really answer about the mining thing, but there's no easy answer to what is a tough question. <laughs>